So here we're going to cover one of my favorite um, finds I had on Amazon, I guess, or whatever, for fence fixing, for not having to cut this fence where it's really loose and re-splice it. These are called Jake's Fence Tighteners, I believe. This little tool you buy, and then these little hooks. And you'll see this hook's going to go around this fence. Like so. And then I'm going to twist the hook around and it'll just stay in the fence. It'll, it'll catch on itself again, and that's how we're gonna stretch this thing out. So there we go, we got a wire stretched up without cutting it. That wasn't my most graceful performance, but I think you get the point. Um, these things hang onto the fence really well. There's another one just down the line where we stretched the top wire earlier last year. Um, I see it's still in the fence. So, Jake's wire tighteners. So here we're going to cover um, a couple things. We, we've got our Aberdeen breed of cattle. So that's a full growing um, Aberdeen Angus Angus Cross uh, cow there. There's also some heifers in here. Like uh, we talked at the beginning, those only get to about 1,100 pound frame size, which for us is about perfect. And I, I think going to see a big shift in the cattle industry towards smaller framed animals. Our neighbors call these the mini cows or whatever. Well, they're actually about back to where cows were when we started, maybe even slightly bigger, um, but not the ridiculous frame size of these 1600 pound animals. And, and that's also going to allow us to have steers that are going to finish out at lower weights, right? So like a thousand to 1100 pound steer. Um, that'll hang a lot um, more efficiently as far as cut up, but then also, we don't get the giant steaks or the huge amount of meat for people that want to buy a side of beef. Um, the other thing we're going to discuss here is our switch from Ivamec to Sidectin. The reason for that is the dung beetles. And so dung beetles are so important for breaking this manure down that actually without dung beetles active, you're just going to have manure patties that last for years and years in your rangeland. The dung beetles are there to cycle the manure, turn it back into fertilizer that the grass can use. Without that, um, in Australia, when they imported cattle over there for the first time, they actually didn't have resident dung beetles. Because of that, all they had were just stagnant manure patties all over the grass, and it actually was becoming a crisis for the grassland because it wasn't breaking down. Um, if any of you guys have manure patties that last for years, you're probably using Ivamec or Dectamax. Um, switching to Cydectin certainly is more money, but it's not uh, detrimental to the manure uh, dung beetles, basically. So I'm going to try and find you guys a patty here quick so I can show you some holes. So we got a couple things going on here. Um, there are some worms in here. Some of those are dung beetle larvae. And then we also have a dung beetle here eating on this manure patty. So as you'll see later on, if we find some more mature patties, there'll be holes all over in the top and eventually that whole patty will be broke down. But you want the more life you can find in your manure, the better. If we're kind of running uh, where you pull up manure patties and you're not finding holes and not finding beetles, then you've got a cycling problem. And uh, so you might want to switch your pour on, basically. Uh, the other thing is, uh, as far as stock water goes, you can see out here, this is actually on a pipeline system. Some of our stuff we have to haul water to, most of it's pipelined. And these cattle can, ac cattle can access both sides of the tank. They're just starting to move into this crop residue that we're going to graze. So this is actually our neighbor's pasture. Uh, we lease this out farther away from our farm. but. He has kochia oftentimes in this field over here because it's just a difficult area to farm. It actually does us some good to get the cattle in there. The kochia is really high protein this time of year. Um, really good gain for the cattle and they're also helping clean up that field at the same time that we're actually benefiting from the gain on the cattle. So you'll see there's a mix of grass, kochia, and actually canola in this field, which canola is a pretty high energy source too for the cattle end of it. So, so standing canola, as far as crop residue, since we're supposed to be talking about grazing cash crops, some kochia mixed in there, and then there's also native grass around the outside. So this is one way that we use a cash crop. Um, the other, obviously, would just be to, to seed a cash crop just straight to graze. So here's a moderator bull. Um, you can see it's hard to tell probably comparing, but a moderately sized cattle or whatever instead of gigantic. There is one cow in there left from our old cow herd you can see in the back and you can see the difference in the frame size between the 14 to 1600 pound cows and the moderators which are in the foreground here. You can also see the size of the calves on these moderator cows are really pretty impressive for April grazed cattle anyways. 
So we're gonna go through what we use um, in our intensive grazing setup here. Um, first off, there's two different cut types of wire that you can get. There's poly braid, which is what I'm holding here, which is way better wire and way stronger. And you can't usually find this at North 40 or Western Ranch Supply. Um, we order this online. It's well worth it. It's probably 30 bucks a roll more, but it's gonna last, from what I can tell, probably 10 times longer. And then there's the stuff that you would get at your regular egg retail place, which would be um, just plain old plastic poly wire. So on this poly wire, you can see the strands kind of stick up above the plastic and then it's braided with this plastic material inside. And that stuff has a tendency to crack and these wires tend to break. On this poly braid, on the other hand, it's more like a little braided rope. And can you see how these wires, they're interwoven within that, um, it's more like a rope type plasticky material instead of that cheap plastic. So first off, poly braid, way better than poly wire. These are Zammer handles. These are one of the handiest things because you can either tie the wire directly onto the handle there, um, onto the metal part, and then it'll be hot if you hook it onto the wire on the fence. Or if you put it on the plastic part, you could hook this handle direct to barbed wire and it wouldn't be hot and it wouldn't ground out. So really handy little handles. These are called Zammer handles, really cheap. Um, and then the other thing is there's different kinds of spools you can get. My favorite one here is a three to one ratio this is a Gallagher wire spool. And what three to one means is that as we're rolling this stuff up, every time we turn this handle one full crank, it's actually gonna turn this reel three times. So that's a three to one reel. This is just a one to one. So every time we turn the handle on this cheap reel, it's only gonna turn this one time. So you gotta really be cranking on this thing as you're cranking it up if you just get a cheap old one to one. So if you're gonna do a lot of moving effects, I would certainly suggest getting a three to one. This is the biggest one I think that they make. It's a little bit heavy when it gets full, but it holds a, over a quarter mile of fence if you get this bigger reel. So you can see the difference in sizes. This one would be about a quarter mile of fence, I think. This one actually, um, or I'm sorry, this one would be about an eighth mile of fence. This one's more like a quarter, and it's actually a quarter plus quite a bit if you fill it as full as we have this here. Um, the other thing is you always want to get one with this wire guide in there. That really helps it. You see how when I was screwing around here and I let it get loose, it spooled up on itself. This wire guide, for the most part, prevents that. The other thing that'll prevent that is not overfilling this reel, which I uh, have a tendency to do that because we have runs that are longer than a quarter mile that I can fit on these so we can do it all in one stretch. But when you get these over full, they can skip off the edge and then we've got to fix that problem. And it's a real pain if it really gets bad while you're rolling it out in the pasture. So. Those are the wires that we use, the different types of wire. We only use poly braid anymore. I just happen to have some of this poly wire to show you. Um, this is my favorite type of reel, a three to one reel. And then the other thing is when we get, so we'll start on one end of the fence. It's usually hot. And we'll hook this on the hot wire of our high tensile fence. We we'll just let that hang and then we walk this out. And we'll walk this all the way to the other end until we get to the other side of the fence and just hang it on the fence here. When you hang this on this fence, um, the handle is still insulated or whatever, and so it won't be hot. If for some reason, let's say we have to start on a barbed wire fence on this end and we end up with high tensile on the other. If we're at our hot wire at the other end where we're hanging this on the fence, that's where you'd use a jumper wire. So we take a wire off the hot, the hot high tensile side of the fence and snip it, clip it onto this wire on the spool end and that'll energize our cross fence for us. So on our portable water setup, what we're using on all of our intensive grazing is inch and a quarter HPE pipe, which is this black plastic, um, used a lot in the oil field type pipe, really sturdy. So you almost can't kink this stuff and you can run over it with a pickup or a tractor and it's not gonna hurt it basically. And we were laying almost all this on top of the ground. When we did that, which you'll see, I think in our later video, we had some issues when we get long runs of this, if it gets above about 75 degrees outside, that water in that portable water we're using for this with all that black plastic laying on the ground was getting up near 100 degrees. So it's getting kind of to where the cattle don't want to drink it. Um, anytime we get up above 80 degrees air temperature or so. So what we did is we buried about half of this, left half of it, half of it still above the ground so it's a little more flexible on how we move things around. And uh, we only buried it, buried it a foot deep because we're only going to use it in the summertime, but that really seemed to cut down on the heat issues. So 
we've got 500 foot spools of this. You spool that out and it's kind of a, a pain anyways when you're starting to spool this because it'll come wrapped up in a, a big round spool and it's a pretty tough pipe. What we found to be the easiest was kind of to roll it out by hand the best we could or it'll still be in a big pigtail and then pull it tight between two side by sides or a, a tractor and a pickup or something and just leave it tight. If you leave it tight there for a couple minutes and let it go, then for the most part, this will be laid out straight for you to use. So um, the best invention I think that they came up with for this black plastic pipe are these quick connects. And this you can find on americangrazinglands.org, I think it is. So if you look up American Grazing Lands, that place sells all this cool stuff, the, the um, wire that you can spool up and these quick splices. So these are our quick connects for this HPDE pipe. Like normally you would have to plastic weld these together when you splice this pipe. Now they've come up with these shark bite type fittings. You just push the pipe in there and then you tighten these collars around the end and you'd normally take a pipe wrench and kind of tighten this up. Then that's gonna lock that in there and it also seals it off. So it allows us to put this pipe together in multiple configurations. And then when we wanna go use it for something else, we just pop part one of those 500 foot chunks of pipe out of here and we can drag just one chunk somewhere else. There's also multiple different fittings. And so you'll see this one's a straight through. We can hook two pipes together. This one has a T and on this T is our quick connect, which you're gonna see in this video. Um, these quick connect fittings are really cool. There's just another piece that pushes in here that turns the valve on and lets water out into inch and a quarter line out to our portable water at the same time. When we pop this connection off, it disconnects um, obviously from the line, but then it also pops this little valve shut in the inside. So there's not a quarter turn valve or anything. It just turns itself on and off. You're gonna see that um, further on in this video being used out in the field. There's a water connector that we just talked about in this video. As you can see, you just push that connector in. It opens the valve for the water. Um, and it also seals off there and then you just pop it back out it's going to shut the valve off and it's going to disconnect the water that obviously would be hooked to the pipe on this portable water as we go along here so so you're seeing our portable water setup here this is a k-line stainless steel portable portable water you drag that along with the four wheeler super tough um, and then there's k-line pipe hooked to that too and that k-line pipe's a lot more flexible than that standard hpde pipe so that's awesome stuff as for as far as dragging that water along you can see the float set up in there and uh, that serviced about 70 head 70 pairs of cows and 40 yearlings at one time without any issues as far as them needing water this is just rolling the fence back with that three to one wire roller letting the cows into the next set and then we would take that back fence down most of the time and move it forward to the next day's set if we have trouble with them going backwards then we'd leave the back fence up and we'd have three runs of wire then laid out the back fence the front fence and then the next day so you can see the cows catch on to this pretty quick this is actually just a couple days into this intensive grazing thing a couple years ago here so this is just showing you how the cows stay on the new grass and stay off the old that's pulling that water with the four-wheeler that four-wheeler will just drag that pretty simply with a chain and then this is our three-part mineral feeder mounted on a truck tire you just pull that along we just put an eyelid in the front of that tire and you just pull it along with the chain too so about a 20 minute to 30 minute project every day to move these cattle. This is them out on cover crop. Um, just showing you basically cash crop grazing instead of that other stuff was perennial crop. And um, same thing, they stay bunched up really well in the new, new day's grass and then they just move to the next set every day as we move the fence. We want to keep half and about leave half is what we're shooting for in the residue. Sometimes we do a bad job of that if we're busy with harvest or if it's really droughty and we push it but we find on the crop ground we can push the residue thing a little bit farther than we can on grass without affecting much because we're just going to reseed it to a crop the next year anyways so there's a couple ways we seed this there's this great plains disc drill six inch spacing thing that's really good for grass and perennial type mixed stuff and then the rest of it's all seeded with our case 500 drill which you can find in a different video a review of that um, you're going to see we're seeding into some residue here this is winter wheat stubble, and you can see there's a very little bit of disturbance that this disc drill does as we're seeding into this stuff. So this is seed and cover crop. This was actually fall seeded um, attempt here is what we're looking at. And then you can just see the setup that we're using to seed it. Uh, Trimble auto steer hooked into a K700 and seeding about six and a half miles an hour. This is the uh, emergence of that cover crop just at the very beginning there. You can see some of the broadleaves coming up. 
Um, later on, we've got the turnips, radishes, and oats, and actually some mustard mixed in there, which was a bit of a mistake um, from our end as far as the cover cropping goes. And then here's just some pictures of those cows grazing on that cover on the annual crop ground, basically. You can see the portable wire fence going across there, so this was all intensive grazed. So this is taking a look at some fall seeded cover that we tried last year. We have such a short window between when the crop comes off and when it comes up that this is a harder one to pull off. But you can see a really good start to the turnips, radishes, um, some vetch in there. There wasn't a lot of top growth we got because we got snow at the end of September last year and it didn't rain on this stuff till about the second week of September to even get it out of the ground. But still really happy with the soil health benefits. So you're going to see as we dig this up, there's an amazing amount of root growth for the little bit of um, top growth that we got on this. There certainly was some grazing value left in that as well. So if you look underneath here, we're looking at a radish root right now, a turnip or a radish. I'm not really sure there, but anyways, those are really good at fracturing hard pans. This is vetch. You can see the nodulation on the vetch and it's a really good plant for setting nitrogen and a good grazing crop. So you can see the variety of roots that we're putting in the ground all at the same time by seeding these different classes of crops. We have oats there. Those are a forage oat, which are really high mycorrhizal fungi crop. We really like those for grazing and like them for the mycorrhizal fungi portion of it. There's some vetch with the nodulation. And anytime there's uh, dirt stuck to the roots like that, you know that you're getting a lot of root, root exudates or those plants are feeding the biology in the soil. You got a lot of bacteria working. So um, there's a, probably a radish basically that's really good at fracturing the soil. You can see how deep that taproot goes and what a good job it can do at fracturing hard pans. Th this was an experiment we did where we, second year out of CRP, we went and direct seeded winter wheat into this stuff without any fertilizer and no tillage ever on this ground. So it was direct seeded directly into standing CRP. And you can look at the quality of the aggregation of the soil here is really quite amazing. So. From a soil health standpoint, some of this land being in CRP for 10 or 20 years is the best thing we could have done to this. Don't go out and break that stuff up and screw up all of that wonderful root aggregation that got built up over time by that stuff sitting without being disturbed in CRP over those years. So um, this is in the same area. This is work ground in comparison to our no-till CRP. Look at how dusty this soil is, how little moisture there is in there, and how it just falls apart. So there's no aggregation in this soil. It's been destroyed by tillage, basically. And it, really amazing. Same area, really stark contrast, right, as far as soil health. So really cool video comparing no-till to till. on our farm we actually have uh, an insurance office where we have eight employees that sell insurance in Sunburst and Shelby and where these offices are we actually began to retail beef last year too so you can see one of our retail beef freezers we're going to be setting up a uh, 10 by 14 walk-in freezer as well outside to store beef so we can get more butchered product to store as we ran out of hamburger and steaks already here for the year so um, as part of that, we had to get licensed with the Montana Department of Livestock. They have to come up and look at the, where the freezer is at and make sure that it's sanitary and that the freezer is approved for um, storing meat for retail. We also had to get a retail small food purveyor's license from our county sanitarian. So you have to get set up not only through the Department of Livestock, also through the local sanitarian that's going to be your retail license to actually sell meat. They have to come up and just inspect how you're doing things as well. 
And then the USDA actually would become somewhat involved as well if you're going to start shipping meat outside of the area, which we are, which we've been in contact with the USDA lady as well. So um, anyways, the licensing, confusing because the two agencies don't talk to each other. But if you get lined out with your sanitarian and get lined out with the Department of Livestock, then you can legally retail meat. The meat has to be butchered at a state inspected or a USDA inspected plant. So that eliminates a lot of the smaller local butcher, butcher shops. Your meat actually has to have this stamp on it then. If you can see here, it says the USDA inspected stamp on the bottom of the meat. If you don't have that, you can't retail it, either that or the state inspected. So that's what we have for retail meat. We're just getting going on that. We use gracecart.com, which is an awesome site for helping you build a website for your farm that we retail meat through. Uh, and it's been really well supported by our community. So now that we're into fall, we're starting to move these cattle around onto some more crop aftermath. Uh, we just finished grazing some canola stubble, which you'll see the cattle getting moved off of in this video. And we're moving them about five miles down the road, um, actually trailing this time, down to some cover crops, some full season cover crop that hasn't been grazed yet. So in the following video, I'm gonna walk you guys through um, what we're doing here for crop aftermath and cover crop. So this is a razor grazer. Our neighbor actually bought this for grazing some of his cover crop. Pretty cool little outfit. It's got uh, two and a half miles worth of wire spooled up on here. You're gonna see it's nice big gauge wire, a pound in, pound out ground rod. So that ground rod's really easy to, to move around. You just pound it in the ground like they're doing there. And then it'll pound back out the same way, just popping up. Um, looking at this razor grazer, you'll see all we did was take this heavy gauge wire, which is pretty awesome electric fence wire. We tied it direct onto some wood posts that we set in the corners. We can do 160 acres at a time with this setup. So um, as we come around and check out the other side of this, this is actually the spooler part of this. So when we're all done, um, at the end, we can roll this fence up all with an electric spooler. It's got its own self-contained battery and solar fencer and that same battery runs the spooling device. So you just push a button, it runs the spool, and then you can run it back and forth onto the spool just by pushing that handle back and forth. You can unlock the spooler and spool it out, just like we're showing you there. And then you'll see in the corners here where we just wrapped the wire around that fence post and continued on with the portable posts on down the line. So really simple setup, no insulators involved, just uh, portable posts and a few pound in wood posts that we'll take back out at the end. This is 160 acres of all warm season grass cover crop mixed with some sunflowers, turnips, radishes, and collards. And then there's also safflower in there, which is that prickly stuff. The cattle won't eat the safflower, but it will leave some standing stuff to catch snow was the idea behind that. Like I said, this is our neighbor's cover crop. Um, this is us this weekend moving these cattle off of grass. So you'll see I'm moving them off of this grass and crop aftermath we had showed you in the previous videos. We're gonna move them kitty corner down the road about five miles. We kind of like moving cattle if we can, just because there's a lot less risk um, as far as loading them up in the trailer. These are the cattle after we moved them onto this cover crop. They're in here mostly grazing the millet out of here first, it appears, they really like that. And then they'll get onto those collards and the turnips and radishes. Um, you can also see in here, these are the mostly Aberdeens. Anything with the pinky purple ear tags are all Aberdeen cattle. The ones with the yellow ear tags are the old um, full-size Angus cattle that we had so it's a good way to compare kind of the size of these cattle and the, the what we've replaced the full-size cattle with um, with these Aberdeen Angus cross they really seem to have stayed fat through the summer on all varieties of grass that we've had them on here and uh, we'll see some videos here at the end that'll kind of compare the size of the cows to the cows too and I think you'll see we're getting a lot of beef um, compared to the frame size of the cows in the end here so You'll look, there's uh, sunflowers in this mix too. They don't really seem to eat the sunflowers very well. They never have in this cover crop mix, but that is a really good deep rooted, uh, tap rooted crop to throw in our rotation that we don't normally get. You're looking at some calves side by side next to those Aberdeen Angus cows. You can see the size of these calves. These are April calved calves right here next to the 1100 pound cows. And there's just a, a lot of calf for the frame size of the cow. So the other thing we're supposed to cover here actually is kind of how we pay people for this lease ground. There's a variety of different things, right? There's native grass with water on it. Uh, that could be uh, anywhere around 30 bucks per animal unit per month on down as long as there's water and we don't, 
we have to take care of the fence and we knock a little off for that. This cover crop that we're grazing, we actually went out and did all the work to put the fence up and we're hauling water to that. So that, that's going to be more like 20 bucks per animal unit per month. Um, animal unit, a 1,200 pound cow-calf pair. These cows are a little bit smaller. So we're probably looking at 0.9 animal units per pair on this deal. Anyway, so it, that's the other advantage of smaller frame cows are going to eat less. So we can run more animals and pay less per animal unit, if that makes sense. Yeah, we've got a different arrangements where we just pay a flat thousand bucks a month for some pasture. We've got a little 160 acre piece of grass that's right in the middle of our farm ground. No matter how long we graze that, we just give that guy a thousand bucks a month. And um, that's good crested wheat that we can use early in the year. So it has a fair amount of value to us for early grazing. So th there's a whole variation of different fits, I guess, as far as what we pay for grass. There's a bunch of unused land on dad's farm ground that we had taken over initially. That ground, we put all the money into the fencing on and we just give him a beef every year for using it. And we've got probably 400 acres of grass to use there. So, um, and that's actually all a lot of bottoms and, and sub irrigated type stuff that's improving a lot with the intensive grazing. So there's a menagerie of different setups, obviously, that we can use here for um, lease payments and, and as far as what's fair between each party. Biggest thing is having water available. When we have to start hauling water, that takes a lot away from what we're willing to pay for the grass. Uh, with this razor grazer, if we end up buying one of those setups, like I just showed you in this video, the possibilities are limitless, especially if there's water close. video as you'll see here we're going to do some uh, direct seeding right into this stripper stubble with our disc drill and we're going to go through some of the problems you can run into with hair pinning you'll see how much more moisture there is where we seeded into this stripper stubble and um, just really in general how much better I think this is going to work for our, the cover and our operation here so here you see our case 500 disc drill running in stripper stubble. This is the first year we've seeded into stripper stubble. We have seeded into some pretty heavy residue. And, and one thing that we've learned, as you'll watch kind of as this drill is going, that you, you never want to seed right with the same furrow as the year prior. That's where your hair pinning problems are going to come in. So you'll see this drill is actually seeding at a 10 degree angle to the previous stubble. And that, that keeps us out of the same row almost all the time. So 90% of the time, we're not in the same row. The only time we will be is when we're crossing the row or when we seed the headlands, basically. Um, as we get along in this video, 
We're going to show you more of digging in the furrows and why it makes such a big difference to seed in an angle. You'll see how good this drill places the seed. That part's really pretty remarkable. We're seeding here at uh, about six and a half miles an hour in some relatively rocky ground. And you can see these shanks aren't even hardly, or they wouldn't be shanks, but the, the individual rows are hardly even bouncing where when we had our hoe drill, all you'd see is stuff chattering back there from all the rocks, basically. So like we talked previously in rocky ground, I think this disc drill is actually a better fit than a hoe drill. We're kind of looking up these rows and you can see here as we see where the drill seated across these rows, when we get into where the previous year's stubble was, that's where we're going to really start to have our trouble with the hair pinning if we're going to have it. So there are the drills rolling along. The only time we cross over into the previous seated row is right here where that stubble's at. It might be hard for you to see, but there is a little bit of seed that actually ended up up above the ground or, or lodged in that stubble there. That's not a big deal if it's just one inch or half an inch out of a whole 10 inch row like we have here. But if you were to have your disc riding down that row the whole time, that's where we've kind of found that if we're going to have hair pinning, that's kind of where it's going to be at. The other thing you'll notice is on the ground here, the combine isn't spreading a lot of straw because... Um, with the stripper header, there's not a lot running through the combine, so we have a lot less straw residue to cut through now with the stripper header than we would have had previously um, with our uh, draper header running on the combine. Just digging in the ground here to kind of show you guys, uh, first off, the moisture that's left. So th this is after multiple days of 40 to 50 mile an hour winds. We got about six tenths of rain, which was great, and then had real high winds. If you look across the road where there's not much stubble, that's pretty well all dried out. And you'll see here, there's quite a lot of moisture left to seed into. So really happy with that part of it. And then the other thing that you're gonna see here is the actual seed placement portion of this stuff. So you look here, I found some seeds, some fertilizer prills placed at six miles an hour, six and a half miles an hour. You can see they're all placed pretty much within a quarter inch um, of each other right down there in that trench. So. Really happy with this disc drill so far. There's some lessons learned, like I said, on the hair pinning part. I hope you guys enjoyed watching what it was like to see it into the stripper stubble, and we'll, we'll let you know how harvest goes next year. So in this video, we're going to cover how crop insurance and cover crops kind of tie in together. There is a fair number of rules that maybe don't support the farming practices that the NRCS is pushing us towards between cover crops and crop rotation on the crop insurance side, although things are getting somewhat better from that standpoint. So one thing that's new for 2020 is, um, which it'll talk about in this sheet. If you look up cover crops MPCI on Google, you can find the same cover crop sheet. It says for crops planted in 2020, which we'll see here, crop year and later, your insurance will now attach at the time of planting the insured cover crop. And uh, the management practices will be reviewed under the RMA rules for good farming practices, which means that you actually can do some things outside of the NRCS's cover crop termination guidelines and still ensure it as a cover crop without an egg expert um, chiming in on it too. Before, if we wanted to seed winter wheat, um, even as of this last year, if you had full season cover crop growing or any kind of cover crop growing during the crop year, you had to terminate it 30 days prior to seeding winter wheat. Now, now they're going to be a little more flexible on that, that appears. So that's one good change here. Um, as we get into this next page, this is going to show you which term is it, termination zone we fall into for cover crop stuff. So as you can see, everything in Montana pretty much is in this brown zone up here. If you look down on the bottom, brown zone one is um, you need to terminate the cover crop 35 days or earlier before planting, except to get the RMA summer follow practice. So that, that would all just apply to fall planting. If it's spring planting, you can seed right into greened up cover if you want. Um, as you'll see in this next slide. We'll cover the summer follow thing too. That's one big hang up for people. They'd like to start replacing summer follow with cover crop, which would be fantastic. As far as soil health goes, as you'll see in these rules still though, there's really no way to do that. So um, in zone one anyways, for late spring to fall seeded crops, you need to terminate that cover crop 35 days or earlier prior, prior to planting the crop. That's the one now going into 2020 where they'll actually allow you some flexibility in that. So if you've figured out that it's going to work to terminate your cover crop a week before you seed winter wheat, and it obviously doesn't appear to be a bad farming practice, that'd still be insurable without an egg expert now, the way the rules run. So in early spring seeded crops, you could have full season cover growing all the way through this year, not terminate it in the fall, maybe some stuff greens up in the spring. 
you spray that out and you can seed right into that and those spring seeded crops. So the, the only thing we're really worried about that 35 day thing on is possibly winter wheat. And like I said, there's more flexibility on that too. What is a, a concern to people though is this RMA designated summer follow practice. So if you look on the sheet, it says see definition 13. When we get to definition 13 of this stuff, you're gonna see that. Let me skip ahead one more slide here. RMA summer follow practice. If cover crop is planted during the fallow year, the acreage may be insured under the summer follow practice for the current crop year, which would mean the um, following crop year, provided that the cover crop was not hayed, grazed, or otherwise harvested. Well, there's the first problem, right? The whole point of seeding cover crop usually um, to, is to ramp up soil health and grazing cattle across. That helps a lot. If you graze that during any time during that year it was seeded to cover, it's going to be recrop on the crop insurance, as it's stated now. The other thing is, let's say you didn't hay or graze it or harvest it, you have to terminate it in accordance to the guidelines, but no later than June 1st. Well, around here, we're usually, if we're going to put any warm season grasses in there, we're trying to get this stuff seeded in the middle of May to the 1st of June. So long story short, if, if you substitute what would have been summer follow with cover crop, there's almost no way that you're going to get to call that summer follow practice for the next year, the way the rules are written now. We ho really hope that changes in the future. Um, the other concern when you get into do more diverse cropping is the crop rotation guideline stuff with the multi peril So there, there is breaks you have to have between all these broadleaf crops to have that be insurable. Um, this chart you can get off our website. That's kwsunburst.com. And um, it'll just show you like, hey, this year I'm going to plan on seeding lentils. How long of a break do I need? So you'll see the current year's planned crop here. Let's say we're going to do lentils this year. Then you can look over on this chart and see the last time I had lentils in there had to be two years, two crop years prior break before I could see lentils again. So if during the current crop year you're going to see lentils, you couldn't have lentils the year prior or the year prior to that. So there has to be a two year break in there. Between lentils and peas, you only need a one year break. So you could do wheat, then peas then lentils, then wheat, then peas, because there only needs to be a one-year break between those two crops. Going back to similar crops, that's where you have to have that two-year break or it will be uninsurable. Um, chickpeas are a weird crop. As you can see, if this current year's planned crop is chickpeas, the only stipulation on how long, it, uh, as far as the rotation break needs to be for chickpeas is you couldn't have seeded chickpeas any time in the last three years, basically. So chickpeas need a three-year break so if you seeded chickpeas this year, you're going to have to go through three full crop years before you go back to chickpeas on that ground again. And then you'll see there's mustard and canola on here too, which have some rotation restrictions. That'll be updated in the spring again on our website, but these are the closest, um, the guidelines using last year's actuarial information. If something changes, of course, we'll change that for you guys too. So what's our experience been with cover crop? I'm just going to kind of walk you through all the different stuff we've tried here. So the very first year we did it, we did triticale, millet, sorghum sudan, forage peas, lentils, turnips, and radishes. Um, so good mix of stuff. We have uh, brassica, brassica type, type crops in there, which are turnips and radishes that help break up hard pans. Forage peas and lentils, both a, um, a, a pulse crop. So we were adding nitrogen back in the soil with that. Warm season grasses, which would be sorghum sudan and millet, and then the triticale. The good, we had really good ground cover, sprayed out before seed sets. We didn't have any volunteer issues. On that note, we really haven't had volunteer issues in cover crop. I don't know why, but we just don't seem to have that issue as much as you'd think we would. Um, the bad, we didn't graze that. And the combination of forage peas and triticale made seeding difficult. This was prior to when we had a disc drill. It wouldn't have been an issue there, but with a hoe drill, it kind of wanted to rake up in there. The peas and the lentils in the mix put us two years out to either peas or lentils in a rotation. So... There's one more important point, whether that is in a cover crop or it's an actual crop that you seeded. If you put peas in your cover crop, yellow peas, then you have the same rotation restrictions as though you harvested that crop off of that field. So what we're trying to do is avoid putting those same um, crops that are in our rotation into our cover crop for that reason. The other good reason not to do it is you're already getting that diversity in your rotation. So why not use a different pulse crop? in the cover crop than what we're getting in our rotation otherwise. So we seeded this stuff too early. The ground was too cold for the warm season grasses to get going. I'm kind of coming to the conclusion, no matter what we do with warm season grasses up here, we're going to have trouble getting them going if there's any competition there for them. We're grazing the neighbor stuff right now, which will be in a separate video. 
that was all warm season grasses. Um, no cool season grasses with turnips, radishes, and, a, and a, some sort of a, it looked to me like a cow pea or something mixed in there. And that warm season grass, it was seeded later in the spring, so it should have had a chance to get going. It grew all the way through the summer. We had a pretty exceptionally hot summer with plenty of moisture there, and it still really didn't get going. So uh, the warm season grass thing is a hard thing to make work if there's a lot of competition in, in the cover crop mix. I think it'd be really interesting to try like sorghum or millet, maybe just with some vetch, see that a little bit later and just see how that does without the competition in there. But still good because you're, you're getting a mix of crops in there with the warm season grasses that feed some different soil biology that we don't get in a rotation. So there's a picture of that. You can see the triticale grew up pretty good. Um, the cow peas or forage peas or whatever kind of vined out in there. And, and I think we might try a similar mix or whatever with some triticale in it. We have been using forage oats, but I really like the cover that crop provides. So then in 2016, um, we seeded this on some ground that was in wheat. This was before we really got our soil health ramped up. Now, no doubt in this here that a starter blend would have probably doubled the biomass because there was some serious nitrogen stress there. Seeded way too early. We seeded it about the 5th of May. The, the ground wasn't really warm yet. Like I said, didn't get warm season grasses going again. And um, seeded in an area that we could graze. So we got about two months of grazing out of 100 acres of 70 yearlings. So that, that was good. It was a drought year, but then it didn't leave a whole lot of stubble there available for the next year. So um, this just shows a cover crop, cover crop cocktail mix about what it cost. So at that point, we're about $27 an acre in seed costs. We've got that whittled down to 14 or 15 bucks at this point. Um, the cost of seeded, of course. So all in there with the more expensive seeder, about 43 bucks an acre. I think we can get that down to about 30 bucks now. And we talked about the fertilizer aspect. As our soil gets healthier, we're kind of seeing we can cut fertilizer, whether it's on cover crop or on the cash crop, and not see nearly big of a detriment as we're seeing here. So this is that cover crop that year. You can see it didn't get really very tall. There was decent diversity, but not a lot of ground cover. We did get a fair amount of grazing out of it. And now that actually shows up that field years out now. It's starting to produce a lot better crop than the crop that didn't have the cover on it right next to it. So you can see the yellowing in these plants, how thin it, the stand kind of was. And we had some moisture issues, but we also had a fair amount of nitrogen stress there. That starts to go away as we get farther into the soil health end of things. I can see that. But if you're a guy that's just doing wheat fallow, wheat fallow, if you're going to seed cover for the first time, it's going to be hard not to put some starter fertilizer with it and, and kind of get that going ahead of time because you're not getting a lot of nutrient cycling from the soil. As you get that ramped up, like I said, I think we can cut the fertilizer out of the cover again completely, but it, it can be a detriment to your biomass if you don't put any with it. Um, and you're just doing a wheat fallow type rotation. These are always the pictures people like to see. This is a purple top turnip. Obvious, huge amount of biomass there. Leaves a pretty good sized hole in the ground. Uh, a lot of protein for the cattle to eat on the top end because it stays green a long time. And then now all that, that turnip actually will break down. So it mined all that deep nitrogen and, and stuff out of the soil, release some phosphorus. The turnip's going to break down and then it's going to release, release fertilizer for the next year for that crop to you. So it's like a bunch of little fertilizer. Um, prills kind of stuck all over and when it breaks down it releases it for the next crop. Uh, sunflowers, there's some more purple top turnips. The sunflowers are a good deep rooted crop that we don't get in our rotation. One problem that customers have had with sunflowers with a cover crop mix is they'll grow up pretty big and they have a really tough stock and they actually will um, rip nozzles off a of sprayer boom sometimes if you're not careful when you're spraying. We had one customer where it flipped the fuel drain tank on the bottom of his case tractor. There's that valve you can turn to drain the water out. The sunflowers caught that and it drained a bunch of diesel out of his tank. So there's some headaches with sunflowers if you let them get too big. How do we do our variable rate stuff? This is a fertilizer prescription. It shows you that we split this field into three different zones. It's not necessarily that the green zone's all in one spot, right? This is a better part of the field and this is a green zone or we have a water bottom over here. Anytime um, we go out and sample this. We sample all these green zones, separate from the yellow, separate from the red. So we've taken this 400-acre field. We split it into three different zones for sampling. We get different sample results back. Our yield goal is not as high on the red zones as it would be on the green. So we just plug all that into a spreadsheet. We know about what the crop needs for pounds of hand per bushel and stuff. And 
automatically have the either the sprayer or the seeder ramp up and down the nitrogen rate. And we've always uh, actually found probably as good or better a return from up in the seeding rate to higher rates in the better ground and dropping it a little in the, the worse ground too. So we're varying the, vary the rate of the seed always through the drill. Sometimes we'll vary the rate of the fertilizer through the drill. Sometimes we'll just put a flat starter on and then vary the rate through the sprayer. It just all depends on what route we want to go with fertilizer for that year. This shows cover crop versus fallow. This is the year that it's seeded back into crop. We had some nitrogen tie up in that next year yet, still where that cover crop was. What's interesting now, as we go forward, um, multiple years from this, it would almost be flip-flopped where the cover crop side would be greener than the side that didn't have the cover on it. But the point of this slide is to show you, well, especially when we're in a drought cycle, we can have some yield drag the year or two following cover crops, just like you would if you'd recrop versus fallow. But long term, we're seeing big benefits where on satellite images, this cover crop side shows up substantially healthier now every year going forward with the same fertilizer compared to the side that didn't have it. So um, don't be frustrated if the first year you have some yield drag because years forward on that, you're building so much soil up, it's more, it's definitely going to offset itself. Um, in 2017, then we tried it seeding on piece double. So this was on piece double because there'd be more nitrogen there, right? More available in. We use a starter blend, so we put 100 pounds of 1620 down there. So 16 units and 20 units of phosphorus, 13 of sulfur. It didn't rain at all after June 12th in a long stretch of really hot temperatures. And you're going to see the amount of biomass we were able to produce on this piece double with this stuff. It was really pretty phenomenal. So this is the start of that crop year when that cover crop was growing. You can see the amount of biomass that we had started in there. It continued to grow all the way through the drought without any water available there. And this is about um, 70 cow-calf pairs. And I think we had 50 yearlings in here on this 100 acres for a couple of months. And so huge amount of carrying capacity compared to rangeland. And this field has really turned a corner on nutrient cycling, where this last year we had 100 pounds of available nitrate nitrogen to use in there. Um, we put spring wheat in there, hardly fertilized it, and grew about a 40 bushel spring wheat crop on six inches of rain. So it's really fun to see this stuff kind of cycling, starting to work. We intensive grazed cows across this the next time we did it, and it really ramped up the soil health, I think. So um, rule of thumb, treat cover crop like any other crop. Fertilizer helps a lot. That being said, I think once we get the nutrient cycle working again, you can skip the fertilizer part. But if, if you haven't done much cover cropping and you're just kind of getting into this and you don't have a diverse crop rotation, fertilizer is definitely going to pay for itself in there. Um, pulse crop and the cover may not be a good idea if you plan on using them in your rotation. So pick a pulse, a nitrogen fixing crop that you can put in there like vetch um, or cow peas or something that's not going to affect your crop insurance rotation going forward. Unless you just want to use that as your pulse in your rotation, then don't worry about it. So uh, wait to seed warm season grasses and broadleaves till the ground's warm, usually late May for us. That's a must if you're going to do any kind of warm season stuff because the cool season grass will outcompete that. Cattle really make the system work well, not only from the fact that you get income from it, but from the fact that the cattle are dropping manure everywhere, which is ramping up the soil health. So that's really the end of this show. I just kind of wanted to take you through some of the crop insurance stipulations. I think things are going in the right direction, but um, they've got a ways to go. They should be supporting what we're trying to do here, not hindering it. But uh, if you guys ever have any questions, feel free to call us or email us at our office. 